Hey, before we start this episode, I want to let you know that my book, Bare Naked Bravery, How to Be Creatively Courageous, is releasing into the world in paperback, hardback, audiobook, and ebook format on January 28th, and I want you to have a copy of it. Go to barenakedbravery.com to learn all about it, and let's get into this episode. Over this last year, in anticipation of my book publishing later this month, which is happening so soon and I can't wait, I'm on the edge of my seat. So I've appeared in a lot of these podcasts as a guest during this launch season, and one of my favorite interviews to be a part of was for the Courage and Clarity podcast, and you'll remember its host, Steph Crowder. She was on our show a while back. I love her. She's fantastic. Well, Steph also released another conversation with someone whose story exemplifies so much of what we talk about here on the show that as I was listening to that episode on the Courage and Clarity podcast, I was thinking, oh my gosh, the bare naked bravery folks need to hear this story. And wouldn't it be so cool to get to talk with her? Well, fate would have it. (laughs) I was driving at that time and I forgot to write down contact Catherine Rains on my to-do list. But evidently, Catherine was thinking the same thing when she was listening to my episode on the Courage and Clarity podcast, and she contacted us. So you guys, (laughs) meant to be, kismet. This is going to be a great story about growing up with a bipolar parent, quitting your job for art after only being an artist for a very, very short time, battling cancer, getting divorced, then quitting your job again and going back into art full time. So Catherine Rains is the artist behind the Instagram account, The Hotel Artist. And I want you to go check out her profile, The Hotel Artist, one word, because not only does she have a phenomenal story, but her work is so wonderful too. One of the things I love most about Catherine's story is how level-headed she is, which is really a testament to how not chaotic bravery can be sometimes. I think it's easy to forget that even though you're accomplishing really great and wonderful things that you can still have your wits about you and not lose your sanity. So get ready to listen to a wildly sane and grounded story of being a visual artist with extra doses of chutzpah. I give you Catherine Rains. You're listening to Bare Naked Bravery, a weekly podcast hosted by me, Emily Ann Peterson. As a singer songwriter, author, teaching artist, and creative entrepreneur, I encounter some really fascinating stories. I'm on a mission to reveal the depth and width of bravery and its benefits to creatives like yourself. More than ever today, our world needs bravery, unique bravery from everyone. This is the place where you find it. There is no script or censorship today because that's how these facets of bare naked bravery are in real life. So if you're listening with little ears nearby, please know that some episodes may contain mature language and subject matter. One of the easiest ways you can share bravery with the world is to send this episode to a friend or two. Send them an email, text, or tweet. Tag them in one of my Instagram posts. My handle is Emily Ann Pete. Or leave us a review on iTunes. It takes seconds and can be done from your phone right now. Again, we need more bravery in the world. So let's be brave together. Are you ready for some bare naked bravery? I am ready. Let's Go for this. it. Let's do it. Ah. So first of all, we found each other through the wonderful Steph Crowder in her Courage and Clarity podcast. Both of us, both you and I, are a guest on her podcast, and we both listened to each other's interviews on that podcast. And when I was listening to your interview, Catherine, I was thinking, oh my gosh, she's so cool. And I really want her to come on my show. But like I was in the car or walking the dog or something. And so I forgot to act on it. Like you're so funny. And then lo and behold, like a couple weeks later, you contacted me and was like, hey, um, (laughs) so I'm really glad this worked out. It did work out. I I loved your, your interview with Steph too. I resonated with your story. Thank you. I I think, you know, 
There are parts of my story that are exciting or thrilling or scary or not that cool. <laughs> but I, I found that, you know, they speak to universal issues that we're talking about, especially mm-hmm. in regards to bravery. So I love chatting about this. And I'm curious about you, like something that I just know about you because you told it to me, <laughs> is yes. that you grew up with a mother who had schizophrenia. Correct. Can you just talk to me? Because I don't know, other than like just the general cultural knowledge of what schizophrenia is and how it affects someone, I don't know much about it. Well, unfortunately, I know too much about it. I realized that my mother was mentally ill. Uh, I was only three years old when I found out, but she had actually been mentally ill her entire life, been hospitalized a number of times. So she would basically... In many ways, she looked like a bag person, you know, that you'd see on the street. And many of them have schizophrenia that are on the street. Mm -hmm. She was hospitalized many times during my lifetime. But in between her hospitalizations and mental hospitals, she looked like a normal person. And she functioned fairly normally, you know, so we'd have normal Christmases. I would have Halloween costumes, you know, everything a normal kid would have. And then she would go crazy. And, you know, basically my childhood stopped, you know, like for a year at a time where I would basically have to be the mother of the house, you know, even though I was only like seven, eight, ten, you know, whatever year it was. I had a younger sister. I I have a younger sister still. And because my father was so embroiled in dealing with, you know, someone who was, I mean, crazy is the right word for it. Just not at all talking Sanely, you know, someone who is paranoid, who is over shopping, over binging, you know, everything about her life when she was in those modes, which usually lasted a year at a time, just looked, you know, it looked like an alcoholic, actually, you know, someone who was on an alcoholic binge, you know, and they couldn't stop themselves, except this was chemical. Yeah. You know, it's something she couldn't control. And when they, you know, when eventually she was hospitalized, because she usually went off for about a year and my father finally hospitalized her, she would come back sane, you know, and she would come back sane and she'd be normal for a year or two. Hmm. And then it would start all over again. But in the times that she was crazy, which was about a year at a time, I became the mother to my younger sister. So it was kind of a joke in our house that, you know, I raised my sister, although she's only four years younger than me. Yeah. But my sister didn't know that she that she had a crazy mother. My, my sister had no idea that my mother was mentally ill until she was 12 years old, whereas I was fully aware by the time I was three. So it d- deeply affected my life. At three years old, how did you know? Well, my father was pretty isolated and alone in dealing with this. So he kind of relied on me to step up. So in a way, I be- kind of became the woman of the house Even at three years old, you know, I remember just being responsible and kind of taking care of him, you know, so I was kind of like the wife, the mother at the same time, much less a daughter. So it it was all emotional. You know, I was, I stepped into the role because part of it was just getting validated for it. You know, that's what I was, that's what I, he needed me to do. Right. So that's what I did. How did that affect your childhood? I mean, obviously you're parenting your younger sister. But what kind of things do you feel like you might have missed out on or things that you gained that other people might not have gained as a result of that experience? That's a very good question. So from a very young age, I remember my the mothers of my friends would say to me that I wasn't a child, that I was already an adult. You know, other adults recognized me as a as an older person, even though I was a kid myself. Hmm. So I missed out on kind of the carefreeness, you know, of not, you know, my life was always hype. And it's kind of like the same as, uh, you know, some, a kid that goes through a parent that has alcoholism, you know, I'm hyper aware at all times of what the family situation is. I couldn't bring my friends home when my mother was like that, which, you know, was for a whole year at a time. And it happened at least four or five major times during my childhood until I was 16. So, you know, that was the bad part. You know, I was always thinking, what would it be like if I just had normal parents? You know, my father was so-called normal, but he was so embroiled with dealing with, you know, a woman that he was responsible for that was crazy that he really didn't have time to be a parent himself. So 
he was a really good person and he didn't abandon us. You know, I know actually a lot of famous people. Gloria Steinem is one of them. She was actually raised by a schizophrenic mother as well. But the father actually left. So she was totally raised by a schizophrenic mother. Wow. Where I, where I wasn't. You know, I did have a father that was there. It's just that he was doing the best he could in a very bad situation. So during the years when my mother was not normal, I didn't have much of a childhood then. But when I did, but when she was normal... I remember incredible things because she was very creative and I had the best Halloween costumes ever because she was a really good artist and the best Christmases ever. But when she was off, we had no Christmas. You know, there was no presents. You know, it was very, it was kind of like do or die. You know, it was all or nothing is how it worked. Mm. But the, be- the bigger question here is the second part that you asked me, which is what I gained from it. When my mother died, she died like a decade ago. And at, the po- at, at some point, I became responsible for her you know, in adulthood. And after she died, I said at her funeral that my mother would not have been the one I chose, but she was absolutely the one I needed to, to grow up to be the person I am yeah. because she motivated me in every way without her consciously doing it to be mentally healthy. So you know, from the time I was probably 16... If I had any kind of sadness, the inkling of depression, anything that I would internally recognize as kind of abnormal, which really wasn't abnormal at all, it was kind of normal behavior, you know, normal feelings. Right. I was on it, man. You know, I went to counseling at a very young age, not because anyone told me to, because I just thought that was, there was no way I was ever going to follow my mother's footsteps. And I did know, because I did a lot of reading on it, that it was hereditary. Potentially. Yeah. So I was always very aware, you know, of my own behavior and making sure that I was not going to do that. So I am incredibly grateful because I have lived my life at a very young age. I started this just being very aware of how to find joy and happiness in my life. And when it wasn't there, I was turning it around as fast as I could in a very grounded way. You know, it wasn't like fake and trying to make it up. I was trying to be healthy all the time. And I still feel that way, but now I'm not scared of becoming crazy. You know, now I'm I'm fully aware that I've passed that. You know, that's gone. Right. But it was a fear for a long time. So in my new book, Bare Naked Bravery, How to Be Creatively Courageous, I have to throw a pitch in there. <laughs> please, please do. Um, <laughs> I, so I talk about how when we are in the midst of a really difficult trying situation, sometimes what we see as, or in the moment, what we see as surrender or giving in or possibly choices that we might regret later, those kinds of things. Sometimes those are the choices that are the most brave out of all of your bravery. Do you resonate with that or is there, are, are there any specific instances that you can think of that are like, yeah, the moment that I gave up or yelled actually might have been me being brave? You know, I think when I track my life and look at all the things that have, you know, my mother's schizophrenia was just the first of a number of pretty challenging situations I've lived through. Yeah. It was always the challenging situations where I learned how to step up and bravery is a a one word that you could call it, you know, and it was, it was a hundred percent surrendering when I was faced with, I have no other options. Like there is no other way I can get out of this except to completely accept it as it is. That is when everything transforms for me. So it's almost like you're forced into bravery. Like there's no choice. Mm -hmm. But the no choice is what helps because I wouldn't choose this. I wouldn't actually say, oh, oh, good. Let's let's go through this extreme childhood or any of the other things I've gone through, you know, from breast cancer, divorce, job changes, all of it. I wouldn't choose it. Let's dive into some of that then, because one of the reasons why I loved your story was because you have really been applying these concepts that we talk about in Bare Naked Bravery all the time. And I think there's a lot of people out there who are practicing how to be vulnerable and how to combine that with being imaginative and improvisational, but they don't often see, they don't see what they're doing. And so I always find it so fascinating to unroll and unpack some of those things. So walk me through like how you became an artist. Well, 
So let me think where, where to start. So as a kid, I wasn't an artist. Both my parents were very creative. Both my mom and my dad could draw, paint, sculpt, write. They were incredibly creative. But I was the one, was basically in my family, I was the uncreative one. You know, I did crafts, I did knitting and paint by number, but I would never do anything that was considered creative. And when I was growing up, K through 12, my father used to, whenever I had a project or a paper to write, or I had to draw a picture for something, make a volcano, whatever it was, he would let me start. And then he would literally take it over and redo it. And I would submit his work. And I really think it was just a way for him to express his creativity. But what it did for me was actually send me a message that I wasn't capable of doing these things. Hmm. So throughout my you know, K through 12 experience, it wasn't until I was a senior in high school that I started realizing that I could actually write and write pretty well because my father started kind of like exiting my life. You know, he wasn't as active in my life, but I never thought I could do any kind of art. You know, I was always the one that would say, I don't have an artistic bone in my body. I can't draw or paint. So it started really showing itself when I was 33 years old. I was in the middle of a, a very demanding job. I worked for a university. I had moved from New York to North Carolina, where I now live, to take a larger job of the same kind, to take a director role. And I was doing really well. I was being rewarded. And I had a clear career path mapped out for me. I was going to take two more job hops to larger universities, and I would end up in a, in a role, the same role, but let's say the director of career services at University of Maryland or University of Colorado. So a large university is what I was shooting for. And I was headed there. You know, there was no, nothing that would say I wouldn't have gotten there within seven years, 10 years. I had gotten a master's for the job. Everything was set up. The problem was I hated my job and no one knew it. I completely hid it from everybody. I was just projecting competence and I was getting rewarded for what I was doing. But I thought it was really ironic here. You know, I'm, I'm actually a career counselor by trade. That's what I was doing. And I hated my job. So as a form of stress relief, I did some career development on myself. And I wrote this long list of everything I loved to do as a child So I, without being told to do it. So I had things like play with Barbie dolls. And I loved making forts and playing make-believe. And in the middle of the list was the word collage. And I had this memory of myself as a 10-year-old. And my father had taken a picture of me holding my very, the only collage I can remember making when I was 10 years old. And I was so proud of this thing. I have the picture to this day. And I just remember how much joy that, that collage gave me. So I said, you know what? I can't draw or paint, but who can't rip up magazines, right? So, <laughs> so totally as a, a form of stress relief, because I had to do something. Changing jobs at that point, I wasn't at the point where I could change jobs yet. So I said, okay, I'll just do that. So on sun, one Sunday afternoon, I pulled all the catalogs together in the house, ripped them up, created a collage. And it was very bad what it looked like, but it gave me so much freaking joy. It was amazing. I mean, I literally, it was as if my entire body exploded with joy at the hmm. same time. I was so happy. That's fun. Yeah. So I, after that happened, and by the way, the, the collage was, really was bad. I mean, it was a terrible collage. I still have it. You know, it's something that a child would have made, but it was so much fun. In the moment, did you know that it was bad? Oh, I th- probably not. But I wasn't going to show it to anyone anyways. You know, it wasn't like, you know, a professional looking collage. It was just, you know, images stuck together on, you know, with a glue, with a glue stick. So I didn't think I knew it. But that was so much fun that it triggered me doing it almost every day. So I ended up over a three-year period with, you know, stacks and stacks of these juvenile looking things. And each one of them was, to me, a self-portrait. I just thought they were, they just spoke to me 100%. So I started framing them. And I put them all over my university office job. And my colleagues and my students would come in the office and they would say pretty much all the same thing. They would say, oh, you've got children. And I don't have children. (laughs) But that really didn't bother me. I mean, I don't even remember getting, you know, that didn't even like phase me because to me, these were masterpieces of my soul. You know, I was exposing my life on paper here. So time went on and I, you know, they were still juvenile. And eventually, I did leave my college job. And how did that happen? Okay. So 
three years passed. And I, at this point now, I was six years into a job I hated. Which, first of all, kudos, because not many people can make it to six years. You know, it was one of those things that I had created this, I had created this path and I was sticking with the path. And I knew, and I just had begun to apply for bigger university jobs at that point. But I knew that if I was unhappy with this job, what made me think I was going to be happy with a bigger job? Mm -hmm. So I'm six years in and I'm thinking something's got to give. And even though I was loving my collage work, but it was just a hobby, something I was doing on the side. So I was looking out the window one day at my college job, pretty unhappy with the job as usual. And suddenly it's like the universe slapped me in the face and said, wake up. What are you doing? And the phrase popped into my brain that said, what you resist persists. And, you know, I had read that a dozen times in so many places. Well, of course, what you resist persists. Well, of course. But I was thinking, well, that doesn't pertain to me because anyone would persist this awful job. You know, I was being barked at all the time by students, faculty, the community. It was just like, it was a pretty stressful job. You know, my employees didn't like each other. It was like, oh, it was awful. It's like, who wouldn't resist that? Who likes that? But still, what you resist persists, and I'm resisting this like a mad woman. So in that moment, it took about 10 minutes once I realized this, that I was resisting this job. Even though it was logical to resist it, I was resisting it. It took me about 10 minutes to figure out what to do. And I realized that I needed to completely relax and accept my job as it is, with all its warts and all its complaining and whatever it was. So I came up with this phrase that I decided I was going to say every single time I felt this resistance come in my body, which was almost all the time. So the phrase was, this moment is my destiny. For instance, an employee sat down. I was on a really crazy day one day, which all days were really crazy. And I had, you know, a thousand things on my to-do list. And one of my employees came in and said, can I talk to you for a few minutes? And I'm thinking, no, you cannot. I've got way too much to do because I knew what she wanted. She wanted to sit there and complain about another employee. But I let her in and my lizard brain starts going off inside of my head going, oh my God, what a waste of my time. But then I said, oh no, 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 no. This moment's my destiny. I have lived my entire life to get to this moment sitting across from this woman and I am going to relax and completely be with her and see what this is supposed to happen. I mean, like, Why, why would, was I living my entire life to be right in this moment? So I stopped my brain from doing its usual blah, 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 I hate being here routine. And I had the most amazing conversation with this woman. And I kept doing this exact same thing repeatedly over and over again. I went to a big staff meeting. I had to meet with all my colleagues once a month, like 20 of us around a table. And I really hated these meetings because they were just basically my, my big boss just talking at us. He was philosophizing about life to us basically for two hours. And I was thinking, what a waste of my time. And so I started doing this at one of my meetings. And I was going, oh, no, no, this is my destiny. I live my whole life to be in this meeting. So why am I here? And I didn't try to make it too complicated. Like I wasn't trying to find like this big reason. I just sunk into the moment and started listening to my boss talk I was eating these fabulous chocolate chip cookies and noticing these beautiful people around the room. They're so passionate about helping students. And I just enjoyed myself. And it was the first time, by the way, because I'd been to, you know, dozens of these meetings and hated every one of them. So I kept doing this thing over and over and over again, where I just kept relaxing into it and totally accepting it for what it was and not allowing my lizard brain to take over and complain ad nauseum. I have the biggest grin on my face right now, Aww. just so you know, <laughs> because oh, I, I, that. I feel I feel that this act of choosing to see that the constraints that you are given are tools. Mm. It is such yeah. a powerful choice, and it truly is a choice because a lot of right. people, a lot of people, do not see it as a choice. They see themselves as a victim of their own life, right? And that is not the case. (laughs) Yeah, I think maybe, you know, you know, when I was a younger, you know, as a young person with a schizophrenic mother, in a way, I was a victim because I I didn't have a choice. I couldn't get out of that until I grew up. But as an adult, I really do have a choice. Of course. And I don't say that to to 
disempower or devalue a victim's story at Mm -hmm. all because victims do exist. Injustices do happen. Mm -hmm. However, when we allow ourselves to victimize ourselves or our situation, not a person in the situation, but our situation to victimize ourselves, that's different. Right. You know, and, and, and that involves your choice. Yeah, I don't think, at least for me, I didn't realize I had been doing it at all because I can, I've always considered myself a really positive person. You know, even as a little girl, you know, I was always the half glass overflowing, always. Yeah. So I'm the positive person, always looking for the bright side. Yet I was still miserable, but no one knew it. So it was all inside my head complaining about this job I didn't like. So this was like a three, a three month journey. So I was for three months, I was just totally into this moment is my destiny. And I would say it for everything. It didn't matter what it was, whether it was personal, professional, I was completely sinking into everything. And I really didn't know what the outcome of that was. I just knew that if I kept resisting it, I was going to be in this job the rest of my life. You know, whether it was in this one or a bigger university, I was stuck with this awful situation. So after three months, I woke up one day and I realized I'm actually in love with my job. I don't know, you know, it just all of a sudden it clicked and it switched over to, why do I want to leave this? This is pretty fantastic. You know, I've, I really, I mean, I genuinely loved the job and it was all because of this moment is my destiny because nothing had changed. It was the exact same job I had before. I didn't want to leave this job. So something else happened simultaneously of this. So when I started doing this moment as my destiny thing, I got a call from a colleague at another university and she told me that she had just gotten a phone call from a recruiter and he had offered her a job. And I was thinking, well, dang, I'm in the same position she was in. I get phone calls all day long from employers. Why isn't someone calling me and offering me a job? Now, mind you, I hated my job at this point, right? So you know, I hadn't done this moment as my destiny had just begun. So I started in my brain thinking, well, I'm just, I'm going to get a phone call too. You know, when's my phone call coming? Someone's going to call me and offer me this job. So every time the phone call rang, it was like a little mental game just to amuse myself. I'd go, okay, here's the job. So I picked the phone up and it wasn't my job. And I, you know, this maybe happened like 20, 30 times a day. And at the same time, I'm doing this moment as my destiny. And I really didn't think anything was going to happen. Like nothing was going to actually change by doing any of these things. I was just, I didn't want to resist my job anymore. Right. So this three-year period passed and I actually realized I love my job. And I picked the phone one day, darned if it wasn't my job, my new job. A total stranger had called me up and said, basically offered me the job that I currently have, which is with the Meyer, the company that publishes the Myers-Briggs. And it's twice the salary, company car, no staff. I have total freedom. I'm in my home office. I mean, I thought I it is the job I had always fantasized about, but I never thought I could get because it's such a unique thing. Who gets this job? I didn't have the qualifications for it, but this stranger was offering it to me. Wow. Cool. It was a really cool thing. But the problem was, is that I loved my job. I actually loved my, I had fallen in love with my university job. So leaving it, so when I got this phone call, even though I knew it was the job, like it was the job that was created for me, I basically said the F word about 50 times. I just could not believe the universe's timing of giving me the job when I'd fallen in love with the one I had. Right. So it took me about a month to really figure out, like basically to kind of reorient myself and let myself go for this new thing. Right. And I did. So I left the com- I left my secure university job to work for a corporation. Now for a cool corporation too, by the way. So it we've is. previously, we've previously interviewed Ian Cron, who wrote the book, The Road Back to You, which is all about the Enneagram, which is a yeah. personality yeah. framework. And so here you are, you are very well, you know, knowledgeable in the Myers-Briggs type indicator, mm-hmm. which I believe we've talked about several times just in passing with in other shows. So, you know, I'm an INFJ. Oh, I love INFJ. I know. I do too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what did you do at this new Myers-Briggs? What did you do with them and how did that, yeah, how did that play out? Well, technically they hired me as a so-called salesperson. 
that was probably the hard part because I didn't want to be a salesperson. But the way you sell Myers-Briggs is you have to train people to use it. So I became a trainer with the purpose of training people, basically get, getting people to buy more of it. So I went around the country conducting workshops to help people understand how to use it. And it was, I mean, it was the funnest job you could have, you know, helping people realize who they really are. And, you know, I, I, I've loved every single second of the job. The bad part is it takes me on the road all the time. And mm. so I get this job and, you know, I'm doing this art on the side, which is, you know, still a hobby. And I take my first art class. I've never had any art class ever, no art instruction, but I took an art class from someone who was a magazine collage artist and making a living doing it. He was, you know, he was a gallery artist. And in one week's time learning from him, I got skills. You know, one week suddenly I was making pretty refined looking collages. And I took one of my collages and Xeroxed it and sent it to a friend in California. And she framed it put it on her office wall and a rich client came in and offered to buy it. And in a moment like that, that moment when I got the call that someone wanted to buy this thing, it changed my whole trajectory. And I said, wow, even though I love Myers-Briggs, this is phenomenal. Art is my calling. And I just knew it was my calling. I just didn't have the skills yet, you know, to claim it. Now, had you known that it was your calling even during that, during all of, were you picking up the breadcrumbs of that story? Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't have the skills to make it a living in my calling, but I knew that I loved it so much that even when I was working in the college, I said, like, God, if I could, if I could make a living doing this, this would be the job. But I didn't have the skills, you know, and I had just barely gotten them, you know, in this one week class and I made only one sale. So it wasn't something that I could quit my job over, but it did plant a forever seed that said, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I just got to figure out how to do it. I have a similar story with music. Like I, re- I remember seeing, yeah, I remember seeing a friend. Well, it was like, I was in high school and I remember seeing a band performing and I knew before I had heard them perform, I knew that they were full-time musicians. So I knew that none of them had other jobs. Mm-hmm. And then I heard them perform and immediately thought, oh, I can do that. Like, <laughs> Yeah, right. And it was that it was that like, well, if they can do it, I definitely can. Exactly. Which became a, a seed that firmly planted itself into yeah. me that was like, you can do this. This is possible. I think when you say to yourself, if they can do it, I can do it. Even though you don't have the skill yet. Because I that is that's exactly you know, even with get the Myers Briggs, you know, when I saw people train, I remember saying that years ago before I actually got the job. You know, I saw someone train with the Myers-Briggs and I went, God, I would love to do that. I can do that. I just didn't have any skills whatsoever, you know, to be a stand-up trainer or even to know what the Myers-Briggs did, you know, in its capacity. But I think that's a real key to kind of, it kind of like sets the spark that it might take, you know, a few years to follow the spark, but it does set the train, you know, in its, in its motion. And I've heard versions of that that have like flavors of anger involved like oh, really yeah that somebody's angry that someone else can do oh. can be successful and that they haven't been successful or that they haven't taken the step yet or that the, oh, interesting. they themselves haven't acted on it or that they could do it a lot better and how you know yeah oh, i could do yeah. so much better oh my gosh this makes me so angry right but that's a similar flavor of the same kind of seed that gets planted that yeah you can do this <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You know, it's funny because I have I have to be really careful. I, I don't have to be careful now, but I I've been very like in the last the last like five years as I've been you know I've been continuing working for the Myers Briggs company. The closer I get to wanting to be a full time artist, the more I can hear that little voice go. Well, I could do that too. You know, I have that skill. And the more I hear envy, the more I have to squelch it down because Mm. to me, that sends the exact opposite message that I want to send to the universe. (laughs) Basically, it's giving me the opposite of what I want. It's resisting, you know, it's resisting myself and resisting them. So now when I hear the little voice that says, oh, I want to do that or 
I'm as good as them. Instead, I go, oh, they are so cool. And I celebrate them. Right. Like, I'm so I'm so glad they've made it because I'm right behind them. Right. I'm going there, too. I am so excited for what I'm about ready to tell you. The book that I have been working on for the past year, two years, featuring stories that I have undergone in the lot like my whole life the book bare naked bravery how to be creatively courageous is releasing into the world january 28th of 2018 and i am so terrified and so thrilled and just so excited about all of it i am really pumped about what's inside of the book i know that the rest of the world needs to hear it because it is stuff that we have talked about on this podcast so many times. If you are new to the podcast, welcome. We are so glad to have you. This is a wonderful community that has been born out of this research that I started when I started writing this book. The conversations that we've featured here on this podcast are like the breadcrumbs that I've followed to create and write this book. Bare Naked Bravery, How to Be Creatively Courageous will be available in hardback, paperback, audiobook, and ebook on January 28th at Amazon. And I um, want you to have the ebook for free, for free. So sign up. If you're listening to this episode before January 28th, sign up by going to barenakedbravery.com or to my own website, emilyannpeterson.com. And you can sign up to get your free copy there. If you are listening to this episode after the book is launched, welcome. We're so glad to have you. There is still excitement happening at both of those sites. You can always download your bravery bundle at barenakedbravery.com. It is free. It has a bunch of really cool things involved in it or inside of it, not just involved in it, but inside of it. I want you to be part of this. I'm so excited and I let's celebrate. But anyways, back to where I was. So I, I took this one art class. I made one sale and I started researching everything I could on how you became a full-time artist, even though I'd made one sale. And so I went to every gallery opening, talked to as many artists I get my hands on. I went to fine art festivals, anything I could do to find out how to be a thriving artist, because I'm not going to be a starving one. And it took me about four years and I'm still working for Myers-Briggs. Which first, hold, hold on a sec. I find that that choice to be a thriving artist, not a starving artist is significant. Just wanted to place that pause there to let everyone sink that in. Yeah. <laughs> it's important. It's a mind frame, you know, because mm-hmm. you, know, you might actually be in a reality. You could be in a little bit of starving, but I knew where I was going. You know, thriving was the goal, not I was not going to be starving. So I because I was traveling so much these four years working with the Myers-Briggs, I was traveling like a lot, like every week. So it was really hard to do art. You know, I was doing almost none. I had no portfolio. I had this one collage I had sold. I was doing a little bit of kind of a little bit of stuff, but nothing that was really finished. And I realized if I didn't quit my job, I was never going to sell art ever. Because how am I going to make art with a job like this? So at age 40, I basically jumped off cliff and I quit my job with one collage behind me and I went for it. And the first year, it was all about making art. You know, I made for one year, I just made collages because I had to have something in my portfolio to show people. And then the next three years, it was how do you make a living this way? And it was pretty brave, the whole thing, actually. Yeah. Part of it was crazy because I didn't know what I was doing. Luckily, I was married at the time. Not that a marriage is a requirement, but having a partner that can pay health insurance is a pretty big deal. Yep. So I didn't have to worry about that. And I was making money. You know, after about year two and a half, I started making enough money that I was paying a third of my family income. And I, you know, I was basically making it in a beginning sort of way. So by year four, I was, you know, doing okay. And I was, you know, I had had three one woman shows. I was in really high end art festivals. I was selling wholesale. You know, I was 
on the verge of what I would be, I would call making it. So I was feeling good. Mm -hmm. And did you feel like during that season, did you feel like there was, how do I put this? Do you feel like there was still that pull to keep going? Oh, I never wanted to, to stop this ever in my life. I mean, okay. to me, you know, to me, even though 50% of doing art for me was complete ecstasy, it was the sweetest thing I could ever do in my whole life when I'm making the art. And the other 50% was trying to figure out how to make a living as an artist. And that was a push pull, you know, a lot of anxiousness. Am I going to make it? Am I going to have to get a job? Oh my God, can't get a job. So it was kind of a 50 50. I love it and I hate it. So in a way, I was resisting it, you know, mm -hmm. because I could not let go of, oh, my God, I can I have to make money so I don't have to get a job. So there was this I kind of forgot what I had learned, you know, in my university job, which is what you resist persist, because I was actually resisting it. You know, I was putting mm -hmm. out good and bad energy simultaneously, which basically keeps you in the middle, you know, keeps you just going nowhere. Right. So I was going somewhere, but it took a really long time. I was kind of like in a slow pace. Do you find that the polarizing pull from either end of like positive, negative energy or wanting it, but not wanting it, those double binds we find mm -hmm. ourselves in, have you seen that in other artists or colleagues or peers? I've seen it in all of my life. You know, people putting out a lot of positive energy and doing affirmations and vision boards about what they want. And at the same time, complaining about what they don't want or where they are. And I mean, that's why I ended up staying in a job I hated for six years because I was doing both simultaneously, which basically stalls you. You know, you can still get, you can still move ahead, mm -hmm. but it takes twice the energy, twice the time than if you can quiet the voice. You know, as soon as I quieted that voice of, I hate this everything snapped into place and I got exactly what I wanted without any effort. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, I couldn't put that to my art. The anxiousness was just so big that I had to make it. You know, I could not go back to a full-time job because I wanted to be an artist the rest of my life. So then what happened? Then the universe decided, you know, basically I was resisting a lot. So without warning, this is now I was 44 years old, four years into full-time art. And I never wanted to stop ever. You know, this was not part of, I mean, the, my, I knew what I was going to be doing full-time art rest of my life. And I went for my routine physical, had a mammogram and I was diagnosed with breast cancer, completely sideswiped me. I'm healthy. I eat well, I exercise, no family history. Like, where did that come from? And suddenly my life was being turned over on a dime. And when you get a diagnosis like that, you have to make a lot of decisions really fast. Right. You know, there's no time. So, you know, I'm making like basically body part decisions. Do you lose a body part? Do you not lose a body part? You know, what kind of surgery you're going to get? You know, and you got like a week to do this. Wow. So I ended up going through breast cancer surgery and all of that was, you know, and actually I pulled in everything I had learned from my non-resistance thing. And every time I kind of panicked over, oh, my God, I could I could die or, you know, whatever, you know, all the visions you have of getting cancer. Whenever I went through that kind of like, oh, my God, kind of thing, I go, no, this is my destiny. Whatever it is, whether I'm meant to live a short life or a long life, maybe cancer is going to teach me something profound for the rest of my life. You know, maybe I'm going to meet people that will change my life. So for the most part, I'd say like 80 percent of the time during my journey through cancer, I was, this moment is my destiny and I'm meant to be here no matter what it is. And for the most part, it was eye-opening and revolutionary in the way I saw the world. So I had breast cancer surgery and I'm sitting here waiting for the doctor to call me after surgery to tell me whether I'm going to have chemotherapy or not. And at the same time, I'm waiting for this big phone call that would change my life basically my old job, the Myers-Briggs company, I had, I had stayed in contact with them over the years and done some contract training on the side every now and then. Well, a job had come up and they asked me if I would come back. And it would be, basically, they wanted me back full time. But it, for the following year, I would take a tour basically around the country, 45 weeks on the road. And I'd be teaching the Myers-Briggs for 45 weeks. And it was a lot of money. And I went, you know, this would, this would take the pressure off my art for a bit. And I would just take a one-year break and I'd come back. Mm -hmm. 
So I was waiting for this chemotherapy call and I made a deal with the universe. And I said, universe, if you give me chemotherapy, I'm staying with full-time art. I will stick it out. And because that's really what I want to do, but that's the chemotherapy route because I want to, I would want to stay home and heal my body Mm -hmm. and I'll do art and I'll continue it. But if I don't get chemotherapy, I will go, I'll take this gig. I'll go and take this one year gig, but I'll quit after a year. I'll quit. I'm going back to full-time art. Yeah. So I, I did not get chemotherapy and I went back to my job. Wow. And with a full intention of I'm quitting in a year. There's no way I'm staying. It's just for the money. And I like the job. I just didn't want to do that. Well, so this this brings up a good topic that we we started to talk about before we pressed record and then I stopped us because I was like, well, stay, save the good stuff. Um, <laughs> I am a big advocate of artists having day jobs, especially day jobs that fit their art and their, mm. their artistic side of their career. I think a lot of at least in the music industry, there's this glorif- uh, I think unnecessary glorification of the musician who is just doing their performing full time or just doing the music full time. And I think that it's all right to be a computer programmer and be a good one and still be a really awesome, excellent, creative, engaging, inspiring musician as mm. well. Mm. And I see just from personal experience in my own creativity that by relieving my artistic side of myself of the financial strains and allowing my day job or my marketing clients to become basically patrons of my art. Mm -hmm. Let's go look at it. It doesn't suck energy away from my art. It actually pumps more energy into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it takes the pressure off the art having to, supply all the income because that really does change the art. I mean, you're, you're making it to sell now, which is not a bad thing. You know, we make art to sell. It's just that it changes the quality of it sometimes because it's really hard Mm -hmm. to, it's hard to come from those pure place of creativity when you're trying to sell it at the same time. Right. So it may not be your best stuff. Right. Well, I mean, if you take an economic standpoint on it, anytime you add more demand on something, you have to, it alters the supply. Mm. which changes the pricing, (laughs) you know, unintentionally, it might change the pricing of that thing. So essentially, like when you're looking at your art and thinking about it in an economic kind of way, and you're saying, okay, now I'm full-time artist, you've just increased the demand, like the holistic demand for your art up a lot. And so the supply has to do the same thing. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you were a business or a manufacturing plant and just said, okay, tomorrow we're doing 500%, the quality would suffer. That's just natural in manufacturing. The quality would suffer if you just in overnight made, had to force it into 500%. So, I mean, that's one of the main reasons why I'm such a big advocate of relieving that artistic pressure with a day job or with some other skill or with another exchange of value. I think it's a really powerful tool for your creativity. Hmm. That's a good way of looking at it. The only kind of downside of me going back to my job is that it, it was it was on the road. Yeah. So at the time, it was pretty hard to do art and do the job. You know, I didn't have a really good, it wasn't a part-time job. And I was traveling a lot, you know, where I was away from home, I was away from my art. So I... Basically, so the next I did it for one year with full intention. I'm I'm out of here in a year. And while you were doing that full year, were you doing art? No. Okay. No, it was really the job itself is so energy. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful job, but it took all my energy. Yeah. The traveling every week. And this is why it's important that if an artist is going to get a day job and they want to keep their art going, they have to get the right day job. Or figure out how to integrate the art in. But it took me 10 years to do that. But I eventually did figure it out. So, Which is why you're so amazing and why I want to keep talking. Oh, you're such a sweetheart. Keep going. (laughs) So this one year turned into 10 years. Because every year they gave me better and better training gigs where I was going. I was still traveling all over the country. And my God, it was such an experience. And I loved it. But I really was mourning the art. Every day. I mean, it was never a day that I wasn't going, oh my God, could I just, I want to go back to my art. But I I knew it wasn't the right thing. And I knew I was supposed to be there because about two and a half years after going back to the day gig, 
my husband of he had, I'd been with my husband for 31 years since we were high we were high school sweethearts. To me, out of the blue, he came in and said he wanted a divorce. And this is 31 years. You know, I had it's like it's kind of like breast cancer. It's like what? <laughs> Where did that one come from? So all of a sudden, I was going to be single after you know never being single basically. But because I had gone back to my day job two and a half years before, I had money. So this was not like a financial crisis that it would have been because I would have been in a bit of a crisis. Like even though I was making money, it would have been very, very scary. Whereas it wasn't scary. It was only scary in the event that I was changing my status from what I thought was happily married to single. But from a financial standpoint, I was set which that confirmed why I needed to go back to that job. It was part of kind of like a bigger plan. I just didn't realize that I was going to stay in the job, you know, for as long as I did. But the entire time that I was there, it was 10 years, this went on, because people found out about my art, because I usually used my, myself as a story when I taught Myers-Briggs. So I would mention my art, and they would get on my website as I was talking to, on their phones. And they would say, oh, my God, your art's amazing. And then my heart was just basically was dying. It's like, yeah, it's amazing. And I haven't even touched it, you know, for five years or 10 years, whatever it was. Oh, that's so painful. Oh. It was, you know, it was kind of like a, this, you know, this really weird thing. But I really was, I basically was asking the universe again. It's like, you know, when, I'm, when it's time for me to go, because I knew the job. It was an am amazing, amazing job. It wasn't the right time to go. I don't know why I knew that. I just knew that I didn't want to do art the way I did it the first time, which was like this crazy, I have to make money kind of place. And so I said, you know, just tell me when it's ready. Just tell me clearly when I'm supposed to go. So at the 10 year mark, it was January 5th, 2015. I said, you know what? I have got to find a way to bring art back into my life. It's not obviously not time for me to leave the job. Because I'm, I'm enjoying it. I mean, I really love it. But how can I bring art back into my life? So I made a plan on that day. And the plan was this. I was going to, I set up a very strict schedule of how I was going to fit art into the nooks and crannies of my life. You know, because we have so many time, so much time in our life, I believe, where we're just kind of like doodling. You know, we're not, you know, we're just kind of wasting time a little bit. Oh, yeah. If I could consolidate all of those wasted things into a stricter schedule, I probably could capture an hour a day of art. So that's what I did. So the schedule was like this. When I was home, which was one third of the time, I had to get up at 5 a.m. And I would do about an hour and a half of self-care, you know, meditating and eating, that kind of thing. And then at 6.30, I'm in my studio doing art for one hour. And that one hour usually turned into two hours. And then I would go to my day job. That's when I was home. And then when I was on the road, I would do the art from like 7 to 11 at night, not, not in the morning because I, I, couldn't, I couldn't fit it in then. And I set up a, I started this with a 30-day challenge for myself. So for 30 days, you know, 5 a.m., even on weekends. So Saturday and Sunday, it was still 5 a.m. And, you know, I often would get to my studio table, whether it was in a hotel room or whether it was in my, you know, my home. If I, you know, at 6.30 and go, oh, I don't want to make art. I want to go, go to bed. But I'd made a commitment to myself and I, I was blogging about it at the same time. You know, so I was keeping myself honest. By the way, no one was reading my blog. But to me, it was the way to keep myself honest. Like, okay, you said you're going to do it. We're going we're gonna to keep, keep you to it. Yeah. And after 30 days, I, you know, we got into a relative routine. So then I started, I said, okay, 365 days. You're going to make one hour a day which really ended up being more like two hours a day, a lot of the time. Right. And I created a whole bunch of art, tons of art. And then about a year ago, so that was 2015, about a year ago, I started painting. So I, I kind of moved from just collage. I wanted to add painting. I've always wanted to paint, but I never could because, of course, I don't have an artistic phone on my body. I can't paint or draw. So I had never tried painting. And is this progression visible in your Instagram profile? I always love doing that. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Like scrolling backwards in somebody's profile is one of my favorite things to do because you can yeah. scroll back for years and just go, look at how far they've come. Yeah. <laughs> well, two years ago, you know, I was just doing strict collage. It was magazine collage. And then 
really last year, I started taking a couple online classes because I could actually take them while I was on the road. And I learned how to paint. I mean, I, I'm not the best painter yet, but I'm, you know, I'm good enough to sell my work. And I started adding paint to collage. So now it's collage. It's called collage painting. So it's both of them. And but what I did when I started when I started learning to paint, I decided that I could take the paint on the road. So I pack very, very heavy. I already packed a 150 pound suitcase for every trip because I have to bring four suits with me when I travel. I since I get free luggage because I travel so much, I said, OK, I'll bring a second 50 pound suitcase full of art supplies. So I was bringing 30 pounds of paint, tons of canvas, drop cloths, everything I needed to turn my hotel rooms into art studios. So I actually, it, at that time, that was like, that's the been, been the last year and a half probably, I was doing more art in hotel rooms than I was at home. Okay, give me some hotel room tricks because I'm in hotel rooms a lot too. And oh. I think, you know, like I've kind of just, you know, learned that the best ways to practice or write songs in hotel rooms. Oh. But I imagine that you have tricks that I don't know about. Well, I have art tricks that may not yeah. that may not go to music writing tricks, but that's okay. So things that I've learned, and I actually learned by just watching other people on, on Instagram. I bought a uh, a shower curtain, a clear shower curtain. I have two of them, so the shower curtain covers everything. Because in the beginning, I would actually stain everything, you know. So I would have to bring a Brillo pad and, and scrub my room down when I left. I don't let maids in my room because I don't want them to see what I'm up to. Mm -hmm. because in the event that I do drop paint somewhere, I don't want them to think, oh, she's been painting. I want them to just, because I can usually clean most of it up, if not all of it. Room service is my friend, because if you, when you're traveling, if you have to go figure out where to eat, that takes up a good two hours of your evening. Mm -hmm. So even though I really, I go to phenomenal places, but I basically forfeit seeing almost every city I go to. Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to eat up all that free time. So I do room service. I also just bring, I have a lot of plastic bags, double plastic bags with all this paint that I bring with me. And I'm not against rearranging a hotel room to suit my needs. And I usually do. So I usually move the desk, the chairs, anything that I can do to make, give myself the biggest surface for me to paint on. Do you have it pretty much locked down to like, I can move into my room in 30 minutes or less kind of thing? <laughs> uh, close to it. Yeah, I pretty much set up my studio in about 30 minutes. Yeah. And I usually bring up like five canvas, small. So you know, when you're traveling with art, I mean, I guess you could do big, but I do like eight by eights and 12 by 12s just because I can easily pack a lot of art that way. So I bring like five or six of them. And then I wrap all of my artwork in my clothes. So, and not my good clothes, but, you know, like my bathrobes and my t-shirts, everything is wrapped up in my clothes so that, because in the beginning I would wrap them, like, I'm just like, I wouldn't be careful and the paint would actually come off. It would, so, oh. so it took me some time yeah. to figure out how to protect my paint. So I've been doing that for the last two years. And about five months ago, I hired a fabulous art coach and she, she had worked with a whole bunch of other artists that I really admire. And basically, I hired her to give me a reality check because I wanted to know how I could fit even more into my kind of schedule so that I could become a full-time artist eventually. So I was telling her everything I was doing. You know, I spend about one to three hours on Instagram a day. I do art from one to three hours. I do the business of art an hour a day and I have a full-time job. Yeah. And so I'm telling her all this. And then I said, and this is what I want to do. And I gave her like four more things that I wanted to do. And she just laughed and said, okay, none of that's possible. And she just said, no, every single thing I said, she says, well, where in the hell are you going to fit any of that in? You can't fit any of that in. You can do, you barely are fitting in what you got now. And she thought that she thought that it was great what I'm doing, but no, no, you can't do anything else. And in that moment I went, oh, I got it. I'm not going to be a full-time artist unless I quit my job. Or unless you hire some help. <laughs> well, you know, no one can do the art for me. That's the problem. Well, and yeah, but they can do the Instagram posting for you. Not, you know, they could do it, but still I have to do a lot of it myself. You got to take, you know, quality pictures. You got to do good captioning. You know, I could hire someone to make comments for me because I comment on every single person and I get like 70 comments mm -hmm. per post. Whoa. So yeah, I could, get, I, could, I could have someone do that. 
that is one thing I could do. But most of it, it, I couldn't. So I realized in that moment that it just kind of came to me. I'm going to have to quit my job and figure it out. And I also realized that the time was probably right with my company, my Myers-Briggs job, that I have a fabulous new boss who was very flexible. It's, it's a brand new situation I was in that they might actually work with me. So about a week later, I proposed to my my boss, would they consider allowing me to be just a contractor and work five days a month instead of basically, you know, all the time? And she basically jumped to the phone. I mean, literally, she's like, oh my God, you know, you're not going to believe this. It's just as like perfect because they were looking for a new salary line, but they didn't have the money. And here I was giving them one, but I could still do a, I could still do a lot of the work of my current job. I just would do a fraction of it as compared to everything I do now. Right, right. So- I actually helped them. It was a win-win for both of us, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't have happened even a year ago. They wouldn't have allowed it because the company had just, it wasn't ready for it. So I knew that this was the moment, you know, this was, this was my time to to do it. Yeah. And and stepping in and having those kinds of conversations is super brave too, because you just have to be willing to have them say no. Right. And I was willing to, I was willing for them to say no. I mean, I'd gone this long, Yeah, you know, if it didn't work out and I'd actually, in the last two years, I had tried three different times. I didn't go directly, directly to my boss, but I was looking at other ways to do the Myers-Briggs on the side and it just didn't work out. You know, it was clear I wasn't going to be able to make the side income. So it was very disappointing each time, you know, I kind of, with my tail between my legs, you know, went back to work and went, oh, you know, I'm back here. So here you are, and you are 10 days away from... I'm 10 days. At the time of this recording, you are 10 days away from taking the leap. That's right. December 29th, I am done. That's my last day of work. And I mean, I just, I'm over the moon. I just can't even imagine, you know, what this is going to look like. I have bought a bunch of new paint and new canvases but I don't really know what I'm going to be doing on December 30th. It's like, well, what, what is that going to look like? It's the life I've been dreaming about for 12 years and it took 12 years to get back to basically come full circle. But this time is very different than the last time I was there. You know, this time I've been in a job for 12 years where I've been saving my money like a little banshee, you know, knowing that I wanted to go back so that I would have some financial stability and not have to depend on anything or anyone when I made the jump. And I have gotten remarried, by the way. So I got remarried about two years ago to a fabulous man who has health insurance. That's not why I married him, but he has health insurance. (laughs) So that does make, you know, that does alleviate some of the issues as well. So I don't have to worry about that. Well, I'm just, I'm also over the moon for you. I know that that those transitions can be really difficult and exciting and exhilarating and, Oh my gosh, I'm just so thrilled. And scary. You know, it's funny because I, I gave a I gave a four months notice, which is kind of like a bizarre thing to give. But the reason I gave four months was basically I didn't realize it at the time. It was kind of like my own I don't know, I was scared. You know, I'm giving up a pretty good gig. People all every time I train, people want my job because it's a good job. It's like, why are you giving up a good job? That's ridiculous. So, you know, four months kind of like got me used to it. And about two months into it, I was getting really cold feet. Like, I'm, oh no, I can't do this. I'm going back. And then I found out that they had actually replaced me. <laughs> you know, so the new person was starting right away, <laughs> even though I was still here. And I went, okay, the decision's made. I can't go back. So then I, I settled in and I stopped doubting my decision. How have you prepared yourself for these next 10 days? Oh, for the next 10 days? Well, it's Christmas. It's Christmas. Yeah. So I wouldn't say I prepared myself at all. I'm actually, I'm actually a little crazy person, you know, trying to get ready for finish my job for the next 10 days and also do Christmas, which is right in the middle of all of this. It's more of how I prepared myself for what December 30th is going to look like. Yeah. What, what has that involved? Well, I've signed up for like four online art classes, one live art class, which will happen in January. And I basically have a kind of a sort of a plan of how I'm going to start exploring art as if I'm a child again. So, you know, I've been doing art all this time with the idea of my brain that I want to sell it. And I was thinking, you know, what would it be like if I could just spend some time not worrying about selling? You know, I've saved up money. Mm. 
and enough that, and I am going to be working five days a month. So I have a little, I have enough income to pay bills. So could I just do art just for the sheer thrill of it and see what happens? So that's what I'm going to do. So I have about 10 artists that I absolutely worship and I've taken classes from a few of them, but I have their art in my home and I'm going to start kind of not copying them, but emulating them. You know, like, well, how can I put that in my art, you know, and create my own voice? And it may end up being exactly what I'm doing now because I love what I do now. Yeah. But I'm going to give myself a chance to explore for a little bit. And then that's my goal for six months to a year, just play, you know, not have this kind of craziness that you got to sell and see what happens. And I think that something magical is going to happen. Oh, I know it will. I know it will. Well, thank you. This has been so fantastic to talk about. I mean, there are not a lot of artists who take the route that you take. There are also not a lot of professional, like corporate professionals who have taken the route that you've taken. So thank you for sharing this story with us. This is fantastic. And I want you to stay in touch and so that we can keep tabs on how this is unfolding for you because this is an ongoing story. This is not a story that is over by any means. No, it's just the beginning. And I'm, you know, I might, you know, the reason I'm telling my story to other people is that I really want to support and inspire other people in my shoes to know that it's not impossible just because you have a lot of family obligations or life happens, you know, life is busy, that there's a way to fit it in no matter what it is, even if you're not even sure what it is, because I really want other people to follow their greatest heart's desire. You know, that's why I want other people to know why I did it or how I did it because it's not impossible. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Oh, this has been so fantastic. Thank you so much again. (laughs) Oh, you're a sweetheart. Thank you for being so present and wanting to hear my story. I really appreciate it. Of course. Well, it's very genuine. (laughs) Beyond your free bravery bundle, which is always available at barenakedbravery.com, your brave takeaway from today's show is to go get yourself covered in color. Go paint, doodle, or draw something, anything, especially if you don't consider yourself, quote unquote, an artist type. I really believe that stretching yourself to operate in a different brain function is epically helpful, especially in regards to applying some of these bravery practices that we talk about. So if you are feeling extra showy about all of that color that you just put out into the world, we in the Bare Naked Bravery community would love to see it. So especially after listening to Catherine's story. So we would love to see all of that inspiration on the page. You can find Catherine Rains and myself on Facebook and Instagram, of course. Catherine Rains is the hotel artist, and my handle is Emily Ann Pete. Just go ahead and tag us so that we can cheer you on and see what you're up to. And if you drop your brave takeaway bit of color exercise into the Facebook group, then everyone else can see that as well. And we would love to have you in there. If you want to join that, go ahead and download your bravery bundle again, and you'll get a link to go join the Facebook group. Okay. That's our show this week. I am so glad that you listened. If you've gotten to this point in the episode, that means you are truly a dedicated podcast listener because you've gotten all the way to the end. <laughs> and I don't take that lightly. So if you have enjoyed this show I and you haven't given a review to the show yet, then now's your chance to do it. It takes, it takes like two seconds to do and it really does help us out a lot. So real quick before we go... If you are enjoying the music, I have to give a shout out to Lee Rosevier, who is wonderful. And his music is, he's our sponsored musician this this season. So I'm really grateful for all of his work and want to give him a shout out. So, okay, you guys, the book launch is coming so soon. The book is so soon. If you want to get a free copy, now is your chance to sign up. There's still a couple days to get a a free copy of that. So go ahead and go over to emilyannpeterson.com. And you'll be able to sign up for the book. The book release is coming. It's so exciting. Okay. Until then, though, until next time, I have one message for you. It's the same as always. It's this. Be yourself. Be imaginative. Be improvisational. Be vulnerable. Because the world needs more of your bare naked bravery. 